It is noon, so I'll go ahead and start with the administrative stuff so we can get this information underway. We're pleased to have everyone here today. This is our sixth, I think, in our series of Wednesday webinar series. Today, we're doing transfer trauma and relocation stress, recognize, prevent, and respond. Um, the webinar is being recorded. It is available to watch for CEUs next week. If you have anyone who didn't get to watch it, we can share that. You do not have video or audio capability because we are in a webinar format, but you can feel free to ask any questions in the chat as I'll be monitoring those. This webinar has been approved for, again, the same as the last few CEUs for activity directors, administrators, nursing, and social work, and each attendee will receive a certificate of attendance by mail within the next week. And you'll have access to the webinar recording, PowerPoint slides, and handouts so you can rewatch it or share it with other people. At the end, there will be an evaluation link that pops up. If you can go through and, and do that evaluation for us, we appreciate it. It allows us to better tone what we need to do to offer you the information you need and give you more on-the-spot information for what you're experiencing in your workplace. Oh, I'll cover that in a minute. All right, let me stop sharing this. And now I get the honor of introducing our presenter for today. Most of you know Suzanne Messenger. She's the West Virginia State Long-Term Care Ombudsman at the West Virginia Bureau of Senior Services. Suzanne advocates for long-term care residents in a variety of matters related to residential long-term care, including resident rights, quality of care, payment, guardianship and conservatorship, powers of attorney, health care surrogate matters, and elder abuse and exploitation. Prior to becoming the state ombudsman, Suzanne was employed by Legal Aid of West Virginia for eight years. She received her Bachelor of Science degree in Medical Technology from West Virginia University School of Medicine and her JD degree from the West Virginia University College of Law. She is a former NAPIL Fellow for Equal Justice and is a member of the West Virginia Bar and the American Bar Association. And as anybody who knows her knows, she's a superstar. So Suzanne, take it away. Thank you so much. I hope I can live up to that <laughs> introduction, Susan. Uh, I'm going to share my screen, so bear with me just a second. Hopefully this works the way we think it's going to. I see it. Yep. Okay. So today we're, we're going to talk about a specific kind of trauma, and that's called transfer trauma. Um, but as we do that, it probably makes sense to make sure that we're all on the same page. So I'm going to do a brief overview of trauma and trauma-informed care just to make sure that we're all starting from the same place. Because while we'd like to think that everybody on our webinar today has listened to all of the prior webinars, we know that's unrealistic. So I want would like to get started. Um, I would like to know a little bit of information about you all. And so if you could just uh, enter in the chat, what setting do you work in? Um, I'm expecting there's a number of you who work in nursing homes. I know there's a number of ombudsmen on the call, but I'm interested to know, do we have any people from hospitals or hospice or other settings, uh, maybe assisted living today? While the regulations that we refer to during this presentation uh, impact nursing homes, the concepts generally apply to any setting. So if you're here from another setting, welcome, uh, and we'll try to provide you with as much useful information as we can. So let's start out with our basic definition of trauma. And that's a little more complicated than it should be. Um, there isn't really any one single definition. And the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, they don't provide a nursing homes with a, a definition in the regulation. But what they do, do is reference SAMHSA's concept of trauma. And that concept is built on the three E's, event, experience, and effect. Individual trauma results from an event or series of events that is experienced by an individual as physical or emotionally harmful or life-threatening and has lasting effects on the individual's functioning and mental, physical, social, emotional, or spiritual well-being. 
So keep that in mind as, as, as we move on. Threes, an event that somebody experiences as harmful that has lasting adverse effects. That's the, the key definition of trauma. Stress in general shifts people away from their balance and makes our system or triggers our system to restore it. On the other hand, traumatic stress does that same thing. It shifts us away from emotional stability and predictability, but our system of restoration is disrupted. And that's what causes traumatic stress. There are some key points or concepts to keep in mind is that not every distress or stress results in trauma and not every trauma causes psychological dif difficulties. And sometimes even when there are psychological difficulties, it doesn't mean they're going to be lasting. And so not everyone who's exposed to even very serious events will be traumatized. So if you think of people who have that you know or that you're taking care of who have gone through some really serious things or some really um, uh, shocking uh, times in their life. Some of them have come out the other side. We, we sometimes call them resilient or really strong, um, but they appear to be un, unharmed. And in some cases they are. Um, and that's because trauma affects everybody differently. It affects all of our residents differently. But when there is a traumatic response, um, it is often a co common response to fear, horror, and cumulative adversity. And it really overwhelms our, our coping active capacities. And so what happens is we adapt in order to survive. And those adaptations are what people uh, in the helping professions sometimes call signs or symptoms, or even worse, behaviors. So that's really what they what they are. They're they're my adaptations to trauma that I'm doing to help me get through it. I want to thank Lori Thompson with the Coalition Against Domestic Violence. She did a lot of training for our ombudsman program about trauma and trauma informed care, and she shared this quote with us that I think is really helpful. And I try to ap apply it sometimes when I'm working through a solution. If we think about it's not what's wrong with you, it's what happened to you. And really think about trying to apply that to a, a situation. You come on, uh, come across somebody who's not doing what you want them to do, whether it's it's a resident who's wandering in and out of rooms and you've told them a million times, you've put up stop signs and they still keep wandering in and out of rooms. And you, you go up to them and you say, what in the world is wrong with you? Uh, I've told you this a thousand times. Why do you keep doing this? Well, you might notice when I say that, even in this example, you can hear the inflection in my voice. You might've noticed that I popped up a little bit in the, in the screen. Um, I'm, I'm getting worked up. What's, what's wrong with you? Why, wh why aren't you doing this? But on the other hand, if I pause and think, I wonder what happened in his life. Why is he like that? Notice even, even in describing it, and, and this same thing happened when I was practicing, I was, I was sort of surprised. My voice comes down a notch. I'm, I'm more introspective. I'm, I'm thinking, what what might have happened? What could I do in response to what happened? So the, these very few words really help frame our approach to our residents. So if you don't learn anything else today or you don't take anything else away, but this quote, I'll have considered my mission up 75% accomplished. And you'll hear, hear me use this again as, as we move on. So trauma really impacts our residents' ability to do a lot of things to really thrive. Uh, it impacts their ability to trust, to self-regulate. It might um, be exhibited as confusion or disorientation. It might impact our residents' um, eating. 
They might eat more or less. Um, it impacts their ability to plan. It might, um, some of the um, adaptations, remember, remember we talked about what we might consider behaviors are really their adaptations, exhibit themselves as ag aggression or anger or an exaggerated startle approach, feeling scared and panicked mood swings, or a lot of other things. And if you just look at this list, I'm sure you can think of a lot of your residents who might be um, exhibiting these signs or, or symptoms. And the reason for that might be trauma. After we identify that trauma has occurred or that residents are risk of trauma, one of the other big things that we need to be aware of is not um, setting off those adaptations and signs and symptoms. And the, what we call that is a trigger. A trigger is something that sets off a, a flashback almost that really transports that person back to the event of their trauma. And that a trigger can be a number of things. And that's what makes our job so difficult is trying to uh, identify and recognize and then avoid what those triggers are. It can be anything from our five senses. Uh, it can be the way the room's set up, what's happening in the room, physical expression, words, my appearance, my hair, the sound of my voice, um, what's going on in the room. So just a, a number of things, and all of this is going to be individualized. So trauma-informed trauma care is a very individualized practice, if you will. And the reason this happens, that a part of our brain, the amygdala, is telling us that whatever is happening, where we are, what we're seeing, what we're hearing, what we're smelling is not safe, and that we have to react quickly. Even though there's no actual danger our mind is telling us that there actually is, and we have to do something. And the things that we do are those adaptations, signs and symptoms or, or behaviors. And that's our challenge here is, is really how to avoid those and minimize those. So in doing that, there are seven key practices that we need to keep in mind. One, one of the most important things is we have to reestablish that sense of safety. We talked about um, that the trauma really disrupts that sense of safety and security. And so both physical and mental and emotional safety are gonna be key in, in reestablishing and setting up a trauma-informed practice. In doing that, we want to establish a trust relationship and a transparent process. If our residents feel that we're being uh, sneaky or trying to mislead them in any way, they're not going to feel safe anymore. Uh, and that certainly isn't trauma-informed. A way to do this um, in a holistic way is to bring in their peers. And their peers might be other residents. It could be other staff, family, and friends to allow them to support the residents in, in moving forward. And we do this through collaborations and mutuality. Most important is making sure that the resident has a voice and a choice throughout the process. One, in identifying what the trauma was and identifying how that impacted the resident, how the resident has adapted, what are the, his or her signs and symptoms, and what can we do to minimize uh, causing disruption to that resident in the future through avoiding triggers. Liz Wheeler talked in our last session about the importance of cultural competency in trauma-informed care and recognizing the residents and your facilities, cultural, historical, and gender issues. And then most importantly, respecting and maintaining privacy and confidentiality. And that's a real challenge when we approach trauma-informed care, because at the same time, we're talking about educating everybody and making sure all of your staff know, and you're thinking, well, how can I maintain privacy and confidentiality? It's a very individualized uh, practice. And what we need to do is recognize that while everybody needs to be aware 
that a resident may have been ex experienced trauma and what those triggers are. Not everybody needs to know what the trauma was. So maybe my trauma was that I lost a child many years ago through a, a traumatic event. Um, maybe even something that I didn't have control over. Um, everybody needs to know that I experienced a trauma, but they don't need to know the details. They don't need to know the details that I was in an abusive relationship or maybe even that I was a victim of, of a, a violent crime. What they do need to know is something happened to me. Remember what happened to her? And because of what happened to me, there are certain things that we need to avoid or certain supports that Suzanne needs in order to thrive uh, in, the, in her environment. So we will want to apply privacy and confidentiality throughout the process, while at the same time, making sure that all of our staff, and that might include housekeeping and the, the maintenance staff and the people who mow the lawn, that everybody's aware that, that something happened to Suzanne, but not everybody needs to know what that was. For some reason, I'm frozen here. There we go. So the way that we do this is knowing our residents, finding as much information out about them. Um, and some of our prior webinars talked about doing a social assessment or a historical assessment. All of that is key to getting information about our residents. And that's that's not a stagnant process. You can't say, well, I've, I've com completed that assessment and now that's done and I'll put that away and check that off the list. That, that assessment is ongoing throughout our resident stay and up until the time they, they leave um, because there's always new things that they're learning uh, and things that you'll be learning about them. So we have to know each individual resident. And that's a key concept of resident-centered, person-centered care. When we're providing trauma-informed care, there are a couple things to keep in mind. Remember, it manifests differently in everyone. Um, we want to remember that for nursing homes, they're already required to provide care and services necessary to attain or maintain the highest practicable physical, mental, and psychosocial well-being of each resident. That encompasses trauma-informed care. So even if there wasn't a separate requirement or we weren't focusing on this uh, separately, that trauma-informed care is already a part of basic nursing home care. Remember that you don't have to be a therapist to be therapeutic. Everybody in your building, and whether that's a hospital, assisted living, a hospice, everybody on your staff has the ability to make things better for your residents, even if they don't have the title or the degree to, to go with it. So make sure that they have the information that they need to, to do that, to do what we're expecting them to do. The goal of all of this is we want to move the resident from those adaptations of whatever trauma they experienced, what we call symptoms or behaviors, to success and thriving in the long-term care setting. And asking what happened puts us in a better spot to learn and ask about those previous coping behaviors so that we know what we need to do to support our residents. So let's dive into the meat of our presentation. And I guess before I do that, Susan, were there, were there any questions uh, up until this time? And, and please feel free to, to type your questions in. I can't see the chat as I'm sharing my screen, but I, my good friend Susan has got yeah. my back. Yeah, I'm keeping an eye on There hasn't been any questions come in so far, Suzanne. Okay, and as far as responses uh, to the question that I asked earlier about settings, we have most mostly ombudsmen and people in the nursing home setting. Do we have any other settings represented today? Not that I saw besides long-term ICF. Okay, intermediate care facility. Okay, long-term care, nursing facilities. Yeah, most everything else is nursing facilities, long-term care. 
Yeah, uh, CF is the only other one it shows. Okay, great, great. So some of you may be familiar with transfer trauma. Um, others, this might be something new. And it really is, you probably could, if I dropped off right now or went on mute, you probably could figure out what transfer trauma is. And, and remember, any kind of trauma is an event. So the event we're talking about here is the event of relocation, moving from one place to another. And for those of us who have made a move, we know firsthand how, how much um, disruption that causes to our environments or, or, or lives. Uh, it impacts our self-control, our self-identity, our self-worth. Um, it impacts our ability to feel safe. Um, for our residents, um, generally, who about 20% have or have some type of um, either major or depressive symptoms, uh, the risk is increased in those individuals. And it's, depression is not solely linked to relocation, but when depression is present, the risk of, of trauma is, is going to increase. Because every trauma doesn't impact everybody the same way, transfer may be the trauma. Remember, we're when we're talking about trauma, we want to talk, remember those three events, or three E's. The event here in this case, the event is moving that causes an adverse effect on some somebody that has a lasting effect, those three E's. So the risk of transfer trauma is increased for people in early stage dementia who move from their home. Um, and you might guess that that's because it disrupts all the stability, all of the, the safety measures, all of the, the comfort, if you will, um, that they have established. And now they're in a, a new setting and everything is out of whack. Uh, the risk is also greater for people who have uh, less self-determination in the process. And whether that's a result of their disease or whether they were excluded from the decision or maybe even tricked uh, into the decision. Uh, the risk of, tr of transfer trauma is, is much greater. There's also, um, for some of our residents who move in, there's either a real or perceived feeling of abandonment. Nobody wants me and they put me here or I'm stuck here. Uh, those kind of things can be real um, indicators that transfer trauma is, is a real risk. If the move was sudden or unexplained, if the, the caregiver at home suddenly died or suddenly took ill and the move had, had to happen without any preparation. For a move to particularly a nursing home, but also assisted living, uh, there's a real uh, misconception in the community that this is where people are gonna to go to die. So I must be going to die. Uh, and that can be traumatic for many individuals. And then also if there's been a lot of moves, even some positive moves, maybe there was a move from a family home to a daughter's home and then to assisted living and then to a nursing home. The more moves for an individual, the more stress and the more risk of transfer trauma. So you can tell how important it is to gather that history of what happened to your resident before they came to you. Signs and symptoms of transfer trauma are similar to signs and symptoms of other types of trauma, because remember, it's a subset. Um, the big things are loneliness, depression, anger, apprehension, anxiety, maybe what's perceived as uncooperativeness, um, minor things, which are not so minor, changes to eating and sleeping habits, which could be a, a real um, need in a, in a long-term care facility. Uh, if you don't sleep uh, and if your residents don't sleep, that can really impact the ability to keep a schedule um, and um, 
really enjoy and benefit from all of the services that the facility is providing. Um, insecurity and a real need for excessive reassurance. Other signs and symptoms, um, being sad, irritable, tearful, angry, maybe combative, screaming, wandering, trying to, to leave the facility, um, refusing care, refusing to do what you want them to do to take medications. Um, it can even result in increased falls, confusion. It can even cause actual real pain, uh, impacting the appetite, causing weight loss or weight gain, and even causing some pretty serious digestive problems. But keep in mind, all of these signs and symptoms are simply a resident's way of adapting or coping with the trauma, that event moving to, to the um, moving. And it can be moving from what at whatever setting. It's really important to recognize and address transfer trauma because if, if we don't, there is a real potential of eroding their cognitive and physical function at a greater rate than the underlying medical condition or physical reason why they're in the long-term care facility. And that could result in increased confusion, depression, agitation, increased falls, increased dependency on others for self-care and weight loss or weight gain. Um, a diminished physical, mental, and psychosocial well-being, uh, behavioral disturbances, which might cause somebody to prescribe medicines, which come with their own set of side effects. Um, uh, in general, it's the transition to the new environment is, is not gonna be successful. And some research even suggests that there's an increased risk of morbidity and mortality when transfer trauma is not addressed, particularly for those with dementia. Big picture, ignoring the distress or, or the uh, signs and symptoms caused by transfer trauma is, is really abuse and neglect. Unfortunately, some of the things that we did uh, in response for, to COVID actually increased the likelihood of transfer trauma. We talked to, uh, earlier about one of the risks of transfer trauma is repeated moves. And think about for some of your residents um, who were in long-term care or maybe even in the community that were forced to move from their house to their daughter's house because it was easier to provide care or they moved from one room to another to another to another because you were constantly having to figure out isolation um, practices. Every move increases your resident's risk for transfer trauma. And unaddressed, it's going to adversely impact their ability to be successful in their new environment. So we, we sort of recognize when or what the cause might be. How can we move from the, the signs and symptoms and adaptations to successful transition? Well, one of the ways to do that is remember framing our approach, uh, framing our assessments, framing our care interventions from the aspect of what happened to this individual as opposed to what's wrong with the resident. Um, that gets us a long way right there and helping your staff uh, recognize that to just take a breath, step back and, and think about what might have happened to cause this rather than why is this resident not cooperating. In order to be able to do that, resident direction is key. We have to involve our residents, get information from them, pay attention to how what we're doing is impacting them either positively or negatively. And the key to that is we have to know the residents. There's just no other way around it. This is a, a, a wonderful expert in long-term care who says this rather nicely and it, it's, it's kind of a no-brainer. We can prevent a lot of behaviors from escalating 
just by being aware that behind these symptoms, there is a story. If we just stop and think about what happened to this individual, rather than what's wrong with them, we can prevent a lot of the behaviors. And if we can prevent a lot of the behaviors, we don't have to use other things like medications or um, worrying about transferring them to another setting and having another risk of causing more trauma to this individual. If we just pause a minute and find out what, as much as we can. And this is a really heavy lift. I, I know I'm saying it looks like, woo, just go ahead and find out about your residents. It's gonna be easier for some residents than it is for others. Uh, for some residents, you don't, there's nobody that knows them. Um, the state is, is their surrogate decision maker and they may or may not have much history to provide. Um, the resident themselves may not be capable of that. And so you're going to start your gathering of the resident's history really from the day you meet them. But you can learn a lot about your residents by simply talking with them, by observing them, and by paying attention to how what you do impacts them, either positively or negatively. All of this starts with resident-centered care. Start with the resident. Encourage and enable their involvement as much as possible and as much as they desire. And even if they don't want to be part of things to start out with, that doesn't mean that they don't have the right to change their mind and that later they might wish to be involved or they might want to be involved in some things, but not others. Really make an effort to accommodate their level of involvement and meet them where they are. This includes their social history, including a trauma screen early on. But as, as I said, this that is an ongoing process. It's not a paper or a, a screen or a, a checklist that's completed and then you set it aside and never go back and look at it. it all of these, the history uh, and the trauma screen is really an ongoing document that has to be revisited and reworked uh, and reestablished as you learn more information. Some of the things you, you, you learn will cause you to add to it and take away from it. And then incorporate the information you find out. Um, incorporate trauma and transfer trauma as a potential risk as part of every assessment and care planning. And for transfer trauma in particular, it's safe to assume that every resident who comes into your facility, whether that's nursing home, assisted living, hospital, has a risk for transfer trauma. And so a screen should be completed for every resident. That's one trauma that that unfortunately is common for every individual that comes into a long-term care setting. You need a process on how you're gonna gather information from residents and their family members, and then a process for incorporating the information that you have into your transition plan. How do you use the information to support your residents in thriving in the new environment? The routines have to be communicated to everybody because if one person drops the ball in the system, it's going to create a pothole, a potential trigger for your resident and set them back and impede their ability to be successful. Encourage your residents to do as much as they can for themselves. Give them a purpose. And this could be a small purpose, brushing their teeth. Maybe they can't brush their teeth, but they can put the uh, toothpaste on the brush. Maybe they can't do that, but they can pick up the toothbrush. Maybe they can put the water on the toothbrush. Maybe they can do the spitting. Lots of things, lots of tools. Break it down and allow them to do as much as they can for themselves. And most importantly, listen and acknowledge your residents' fears and be aware of what they're telling you. And that might not be words. It could be with actions, the signs and symptoms and behaviors. 
what we're working on in developing trauma-informed care is creating new relationships and building on the relationships that the residents already have. Those relationships are going to be a key element of trauma-informed care and a key element of healing or moving forward after trauma. In order to do that, you have to understand the prevalence and impact of whatever trauma it was, promote safety and earn trust, embrace diversity, provide holistic care, and that's medical and social uh, and spiritual care in addition to just the routine um, services. Remember the person's strengths, choice, and autonomy. Share power and decision-making with them as much as is possible. And in all of your communications, do it with compassion. All of that is key to building relationships. And that's where the healing happens in those relationships. Build relationships and even friendships. And you, have, you do have to be careful uh, in maintaining a professional boundary between the staff and, and your, your residents. But <clears throat> all of this is going to foster trust. You can do that by telling stories or negotiating personal care routines, things that they don't have to be one way or another. You can, there's a lot of flexibility. Allow the resident to direct those care, to listen. The most important thing is, is to remember to treat our residents as humans like we would like to be treated and not just beds or um, numbers that have to be cared for or, or achieved. Put your, your time with them as the opportunity to make a new friend. And that may not be a best friend, but it's, it's always okay to be friendly um, and warm and compassionate in providing care. Uh, I want to thank Hannah Thurman. Hannah is a, a consultant who provided a lot of information to the Ombudsman Program about transfer trauma and trauma-informed uh, care. And she reminded us of some very simple wor uh, words. Listen, be kind, and allow time. And almost anything that's happening with our residents, if we use this approach, on the other side, it's going to be better. Might not be fixed, but it will almost always be better. So how can we incorporate our, our friends and family? Well, the first thing we need to do is educate our friends and family from the very beginning of how important it is to include the resident and keep them involved in this process. Because your, your families and, and friends may be experiencing their own level of transfer trauma with this move, uh, there's, they have a number of uh, feelings and emotions when they make the move to long-term care, guilt, um, being overwhelmed, um, some unrealistic expectations. Um, so it's important to recognize and educate them and then stick to it that the resident needs to be involved. So many times these situations get exacerbated because we allow families and friends to assume a, more of a role than they should have. And then later on, we realize our mistake and try to pull it back. And it's really like toothpaste. Once it's out of the tube, you cannot pull it back without making a big mess. At least I've never been able, able to. And that's the same thing with our families. So from the get-go, we need to emphasize and, and support how important it is for this to be about the resident and for the resident to have as much control as possible. Have established good community, um, good communications, um, encouraging uh, your families and friends to help the resident make the room feel like home in the way that the resident wants. Uh, and then while you're giving all this information to your um, fam residents, family, and friends, 
You also want to get something from them, and they can be a valuable source of information about our residents' lives, habits, preferences, routines, and emotions. But there's a caveat with this. Remember, this is secondhand information. This is what your, your residents' families and friends think about what your resident likes or dislikes. So you're always going to need to circle back to the resident to find out whether that's true. You know, my daughter thinks I love peas she because she makes peas and she grows them in her garden. But the reality is I only eat peas to make her happy. I can't stand peas. So you're not going to give your resident peas in that case. And there's a, a lot more complicated information that you might learn uh, about that. And then Help your residents and uh, or your family and friends know that some of this distress and upheaval is, is normal. It is a normal part of the moving process, move, normal part of coming to long-term care. We acknowledge that, but we've got a plan to uh, identify when it becomes a problem for your mom or your uncle or your dad. Um, and we have a plan to, to help them thrive and help them cope with this and then actually have a plan to do it. <laughs> so the e event in this um, that causes trauma to our residents in this case is the actual move. And so there are three key times that I wanna spend a little bit of time talking about and that's the admissions process. But this can also happen in a room or roommate change, because once again, it's the move. It's, it's not coming into a building. And then also a discharge. So let's talk a little bit about that. So we'll start with admission. During last month's webinar, Liz Wheeler pointed out that, that in addressing any kind of trauma, it might be helpful to use four R's. So if we apply those four R's to the trauma potentially caused by admission to a long-term care facility, we can break it down in this way. The realization is helping people on the staff and caregivers understand the importance of recognizing transfer trauma and what the impact is on residents. And then actually educating them to be able to recognize what those signs and symptoms, the adaptations, behaviors might be considering. Providing them with enough information and developing a plan to resist re-traumatization. Those are the triggers. What can we do to, to avoid that? And then responding ensuring that everybody understands what are the strategies in place to reduce transfer trauma and to recognize it. And then as a key, another thing, and I'm, I'm sure most of you already know this, is that those first 30 days are really key. So you wanna be extra vigilant to watch out for elopement or um, inappropriate leaving of the of the facility during those first 30 days while people are getting adjusted and acclimated to a new setting, particularly for your residents who have dementia. Involve the residents as much as possible according to their preference. This is not a hostage situation. So if they don't want to be involved, um, we, we don't wanna make them, but at the same time, we wanna make sure that we're offering them as many opportunities to be involved in the process and the opportunity to make as many decisions as they can. That might be tours uh, before they actually move to the facility and then act after they come. And those tours might have to be repeated uh, depending on the, the residents' uh, abilities and capacities. It might not be enough just to have a, a tour the first day you might have to have a tour every week or, or maybe even every day, uh, some type of a tour to help your resident based on their abilities and their desires to really thrive and be successful uh, in, your, in the new facility. Reassuring families that you have a plan and actually having a plan and then following the plan. And then the more... Um, 
doing this will allow your residents to have more personal autonomy, uh, even though they're losing the independence of living on their own or living in another environment. And the more personal autonomy, the less likely uh, the risk of transfer trauma or the less impact it'll have. Welcoming new residents is a really important piece of this. You cannot over welcome someone. Once again, you're gonna read your resident's reaction and there are, are some people that will do much better. I might be one of those, you know, enough already. I get, get the point, <laughs> just let me figure things out. Uh, but for other residents, uh, the more you can welcome them and feel part of your facility, uh, home, uh, assisted living, intermediate care facility, the more likely they are to be successful. And those are learning about your resident, helping them understand what, what the expectations are. If there are schedules, things that happen that can't be changed based on their preference, what are those? Um, use as much familiarity, allow them to bring as many personal belongings as is feasible and as they desire uh, in their new place. Um, might be helpful to set up a buddy system with a roommate or another resident or a staff member to make the adjustment a little easier. Um, have some in informal get to know you meetings with their direct care staff. Uh, and in some buildings, and this is going to depend on your own building, this might be more feasible than others, but you know, having a little social um, with the um, floor manager and the um, CNAs uh, and the housekeeping staff, maybe. These are the people you're gonna see all the time and we just wanted to come in and welcome you. And this is the person you contact if you have problems or questions or even having the social worker or the activities person meet with new residents uh, separately in the dining room to have a cup of coffee or to work a puzzle or, or even watch a television show together. Uh, and build, build, start to build that relationship, build that trust uh, upon which you can learn some additional information and help to learn what you can do to help this resident thrive in the new situation. You can apply some of those same concepts, concepts to a room or roommate change. And in this situation, we've actually got some language in our uh, state rule that sort of directs or acknowledges that this is a potential problem and sets an expectation for nursing homes in particular to make efforts to assure that the changes are implemented with the least disruption to the resident's life. And the federal guidelines from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services for Nursing Homes state state the obvious. Moving to a new room or changing roommates is challenging. Well, yes, it is. And the residents should be provided the opportunity to see the new location, meet the new ro roommate, and ask questions. And I think that's uh, an, another time where the um, Joan Gilby's quote uh, really comes in. A lot of behaviors could be prevented by slowing things down and allowing the resident to uh, ask questions and intervene. So sometimes room changes or the introduction of a new roommate has to happen. We think it has to happen relatively quickly, but in most every situation, there is a time to take a pause and allow the residents who are gonna be impacted, either the new roommate or the existing roommate um, to get adjusted, to ask questions, to figure things out before the change has to happen. And this is particularly true when a, a resident's roommate passes away. And that's the reason that the resident either has to get a new roommate or change rooms. Um, this has got language from the federal guidance to the federal regulations. The resident should be supported when their roommate passes away by providing them time to adjust before moving another person into the room. And the length of time needed to adjust may differ depending on the resident. 
Once again, know your residents, person-centered care. While there is a business aspect to moving residents around and bringing in new roommates, there's also a personal care aspect to that. And both of those have to be met and accommodated in providing resident-centered trauma-informed care. And then last but not least, discharge. Our regulations really don't rec directly recognize transfer trauma, but the federal regulations for nursing homes say that facilities have to provide sufficient preparation to residents to ensure a safe and orderly transfer. The guidance says that sufficient preparation and orientation means that the facility takes steps under its control to minimize anxiety. Examples are explaining why the resident is leaving, whether this is going to the emergency room or leaving the facility, working with them to make sure that all of their possessions are not left behind or lost, and ensuring that the staff handle those discharges in a way that minimizes anxiety and depression and recognizes characteristic reactions identified by the resident's assessment and care plan. So if we know our residents, we know what's going to be upsetting for them, what could potentially trigger uh, the risk or increase the risk of transfer trauma. And the regulations actually expect and require nursing homes to address this prior to discharge from the long-term care facility. Our state rule actually says it in those words. In the event of an involuntary transfer, the nursing home um, must develop a plan to minimize transfer trauma. And this could include counseling the resident about community resources and taking steps to assure safe relocation. So that's what happens, that's what's required when it's a, a, a discharge uh, that the resident isn't in favor of. And you can imagine the impact on the resident, the likelihood of increased stress when the resident is moving against their will. If they thought they weren't wanted to be for, imagine how it feels to say you have to get out because we can't take care of you or, or worse, we don't want to take care of you, the perception that they feel. So the risk of transfer trauma for all of your residents who are being involuntarily discharged and whether that's due to payment or what they got better uh, and you're deciding that they can't stay there anymore, Transfer trauma is a real risk that must be identified and addressed. But even when they want to do it, there's still a risk of transfer trauma. It's always stressful. Think about when you moved to your dream house. Uh, things didn't go as, as planned. And there were a lot of times when you probably wished that you weren't doing this. Why did I decide? Because it was different. Things didn't work out the way you planned. So even for our residents who are looking forward to a move, um, it can be, there's the risk of transfer trauma. There's a real tension between the desire for independence and leaving behind that 24 seven people that the nursing home or assisted living or even hospital was able to provide. I'm going home by myself and that's gonna be different for me and how, how will I adjust? Another expert says the best means of prevention is to slow it down until your resident can participate in the decision. So there are some really good things happening in West Virginia right now, and I wanted to take the a minute to highlight some of those good things. You might recognize um, what your facility is doing. Um, if you'd like, go ahead and type into the chat some good things that your facility is doing to either recognize or address or minimize transfer trauma amongst your residents. Some nursing homes are really maximizing their resident councils 
And keep in mind that resident councils are just that. They're councils of the residents, directed by the residents for the residents. So we can't make our resident councils do these things, even if we think they're good ideas. But sometimes the resident councils are looking for ways to be more impactful. And we can certainly suggest to them that this is something they might consider. Uh, whether they come together in, in a learning circle format so that each of them can learn from one another. Um, this helps residents build friendships with each other and creates an opportunity for them to discuss their concerns and fears. Your resident councils might create a welcome wagon for new residents where the resident council president or some other designated members of the resident council go and meet with new residents and welcome them, maybe even give them some sort of a, a token gift or, or welcoming thing. The resident council may set up a buddy system and sort of partner with new residents um, to help make the move or transition easier. And sometimes this can just happen in a spontaneous way as part of the resident council meeting. They're talking and somebody shares, I remember when I moved here, how hard it was. And that can be a wonderful opening um, for new residents to uh, participate and once again, start to build those relationships in the facility that will help them move forward and really thrive in the new setting. Some of you are really doing a great job of, of using your activities department, and they can really be key because of the time they have to spend with residents. Um, and they're doing informal, not care things. They're not usually giving residents a bath or not usually helping them in the bathroom. Um, they're, they're doing the fun stuff. And so they have the opportunity to really develop great relationships um, with the residents, those informal relationships. We're all working a puzzle and the activities professional starts to have a conversation and allows me to feel safe. I really like work and puzzles, and I could start sharing some of the things that might have happened to me. I, I remember my daughter and I used, used to work puzzles all the time, and she's gone now, and, and that I really had a hard time. Once the activity staff learns that information, then they should circle back and share that information with the rest of the, um, with the, rest of the staff. One of our participants has shared that they have a therapy dog that comes weekly named Simba. Oh, great. That's that's a great idea. And and for, for many residents, that, that is a real plus because uh, another um, loss when many residents come to our, our long-term care facilities is, is they have to give up their pet. Uh, and sometimes that was the primary relationship that, that they had. So that, that's a wonderful idea. And then I wanted to highlight uh, what was the Shepherd program um, that used to be operational at our former AMFM facilities. And I'm not sure now that Communicare is, is the owner, if you all are still doing that. So if I've got any AMFM folks, uh, former AMFM folks on the line, if you know about this, um, if you want to type into the chat, whether you're still doing it or doing something different. And this is really, rather than having a, a, a resident buddy, this is creating a staff buddy. Uh, a, a staff person that really mentors the person uh, for the first couple times uh, in the facility to help them acclimate, to be their contact person, their, their go-to, if, if you will. Um, and they extend the program if it's a particularly di difficult transition based on their individual residence need. Uh, they might have that person stick with them long enough. And I suspect that in some cases, there's a relationship that gets established and that buddy persists long after the per, their new resident graduates from the Shepherd program and, and that staff person becomes a friend. And that also pr promotes and, and supports the resident's uh, ability to thrive. Yes. Cabell Healthcare no longer does that. Okay. So maybe a, a, a good idea uh, for those of you who are, who are looking uh, for ways. And I know we're right at one o'clock. We're right at the end. So I'm going to wrap up real quickly. There might be times when 
things are really going south for the resident and it, there may be a time to involve an expert. Um, if there's a real significant decline in, in function or safety, uh, it might be time to bring in a therapist and that might be a, a physical therapist or it, it might be a behavioral health therapist to uh, help maximize the person's uh, potential and reduce the behaviors or, or adaptations. The key to all this is knowing your residents from the day they come into the facility to find out as much information as what happened to them before and what happened after. Recognizing that trauma ex exists, uh, the definition, an event that an individual experienced that caused harmful effects. Uh, for transfer trauma, the event is going to be moving, and that can be moving from one place to another, one room to another, even when the resident wants to do it. Realizing that there's a risk for tr transfer trauma, recognizing what that uh, trauma is, what are the resident's triggers, responding to the, those in a way that resists re-traumatization is key to a trauma-informed approach. Takeaways are that many of our residents have experienced trauma. All of our residents are at risk of transfer trauma by virtue of the move. Even when it's positive, that can be traumatic for some individuals. Uh, it's our challenge to take steps to address and minimize the transfer trauma with a resident-directed approach and reach out to the experts when it's needed. I want to give credit to Lori and Hannah for all their help and hard work. And here are some additional resources um, that S Susan will share when she shares the slide deck. And there's my contact information. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to contact me, or you can always contact an ombudsman and, and they'll be glad to help you. Thank you, Suzanne. What a wonderful presentation, a wealth of information you've just shared. Um, again, we want to thank you for being here, ask you to complete the evaluation that pops up at the end of the webinar. If, um, not if, let me say, let me start over. It's not Monday and I'm having a Monday. Um, the certificates as well as the recording and the PowerPoint will also be sent out hopefully within the next week. If you have any questions that you didn't ask today that you think of later, please feel free to email me or directly to Suzanne and we'll get those answers back out to you. We have one more formal webinar scheduled for right now. That one will be on August the 23rd and it's self-care while helping others. You got to make sure to take care of yourself while you're trying to take care of other people or you, you can't serve them or yourself either one very well. Again, that will be August the 23rd and that link for that registration will be sent out one day next week as well. Thanks, Suzanne. Thanks everybody for joining us. Thanks everyone. Have a great day.